But we begin tonight with the most American of realities. If you're a rich white guy, and especially if you're a celebrity and a former president, not only are you above the law, you are so above the law that if you get indicted for trying to overturn an election and thus overthrow the government, that case isn't even about you. Today, Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee ruled that Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis will not be disqualified from prosecuting the racketeering case against Donald Trump. Trump tried it. It didn't work. His case will be prosecuted in Georgia. MAGA Inc. failed to prove a conflict of interest, perhaps because there was no conflict of interest. But in making that ruling, Judge McAfee, a Federalist Society alumnus, managed to still help Donald Trump, ruling that because of a so-called appearance of impropriety, either Fonnie Willis or the special prosecutor with whom she had a relationship must step down from the case. And so special assistant district attorney Nathan Wade resigned from the case just hours after the decision, writing, quote, I am offering my resignation in the interest of democracy, in dedication to the American public, and to move this case forward as quickly as possible. Make no mistake, this was a victory for Fonnie Willis, since the RICO case against Trump and his fellow defendants will go on. But the judge's decision also came with a strong rebuke of Willis's, quote, lapse in judgment. And this is where we need to pause. Fonnie Willis's lapse in judgment? Defense attorneys argue that Willis should have been removed from the case because of her relationship with Wade, with whom she hired in November of 2021. But let's remember what this case is actually about. Willis had charged Trump and 18 co-defendants with racketeering for their alleged actions in trying to overturn the 2020 election. Four have taken guilty pleas. But today, what we got to do in America was ask questions about Willis and Wade. When their romantic relationship began, where they traveled and how much they paid for dinner, and about the woman prosecutors alleged had bad judgment. We're talking about everybody, except the guy who tried to overthrow the government. The guy who, in a taped call, vaguely threatened Georgia's Republican Secretary of State and pressured him to steal an election. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. It's a bizarre world. Bizarre, yet predictable. Trump is either the luckiest guy in the world, or this country was built for rich men like him to thrive. Two things can be true. Only in America can a case against a white man trying to overthrow an election morph into a debate over a black woman's consensual relationship and the vacations she took. Judge McAfee said Willis's romantic relationship raised the appearance of impropriety. He pointedly concluded that an odor of mendacity remains. He also described Willis's January speech before an historic black church in Atlanta as legally improper because she accused her critics of playing the race card by questioning her right to appoint Wade. What does that have to do with the RICO case against Trump and his co-defendants, you ask? Oh, right, nothing. Except that Judge McAfee, like Fonnie Willis, is up for re-election. He faces primary challengers. And for a conservative judge, one who already reduced the number of counts against Trump last week, and who, as part of his re-election media tour, appeared last week on a talk radio show hosted by a conservative Trump fan while we were all awaiting his decision, no odor of mendacity there, I suppose. I mean, if you can't give Trump an outright win by throwing out the case, since the law gives you no reason to do that, what better way to still be helpful? than to give Trump and his right-wing media friends some talking points. I mean, he couldn't find anything unlawful about Fonnie Willis and her consensual relationship, so instead, he festooned his decision with gratuitous critiques of her behavior, tone policing her attitude, and the level of black lady sassiness, uppityness, you might say. Certainly helpful for his political future and certainly helpful for Trump and the right-wing slime machine who can continue to try to make this case about Fonnie Willis. If I'm being honest, it's giving special counsel Robert Herr, the self-declared Republican prosecutor who threw in gratuitous personal critiques of President Biden's memory and age like an amateur neurologist while explaining his decision not to prosecute him 
for keeping classified documents. Like Mr. Herr, Judge McAfee put a right-wing spin on his decision that didn't need to be there. And it rose like a delicious foam for the MAGA cult to devour. Today, America is breathlessly debating Fonnie Willis and not the adjudicated sexual abuser who defrauded banks and insurers, stole classified information and hid them in his bathroom and under his bed, and who is dogged by a half a billion dollars in legal debt that his brokest voters will pay for him, and who still, despite all of that, faces zero accountability in America, clearly, which was built for men like him. The man who long ago said this about sexually abusing women, but which also seems to apply to every other criminal thing that he has done. It's like a magnet. You just click. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab him by the <laughs> I can do anything. When you're a star, you can do anything. If there is one thing that Trump ever said that is true, it's that. Joining me now is Paul Butler, MSNBC legal analyst and a former federal prosecutor, and Katie Fang, trial attorney and host of the Katie Fang show. Um, friends, I, I just, I have to play for you because, you know, later, earlier today on Morning Joe, Anand Girdadas spoke my, my, my feelings because I've, I've been all in my feelings about, about this all morning. My poor team, I've been all, all deep in my feelings about what's happening in Georgia. Let me just let you listen to what Anand Girdadas had to say this morning on Morning Joe. This is a case about racketeering and not racketeering to like make some money behind a laundromat. This is a case about racketeering to end American democracy. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are people in that DA's office who as flawed human beings got into a loving relationship and took some trips. These are people who are normal human beings who made mistakes who are, remind, to remind us all, up against someone who tried to end American democracy, which is the substance of the case. Katie, I want to let you go first, because I feel like the woman of color in this case, even the media commentary on it, is still putting her on trial instead of the defendants. Let's put the mug shots up. These are the people on trial. Katie, your thoughts. And that's what Fani Willis tried to refocus and recenter the conversation on when she was forced to take the stand to defend herself. And I want to say that although she waived any objections to a subpoena, Joy, to testify, did she really ever have options left? Because when you're under attack and your personal character is being assailed in a case to announce point, which is nothing to do with her personal life, she had to take the stand. And when she did, she said, I'm not on trial. No matter how hard you try to put me on trial, I am not on trial. Those people that tried to steal the 2020 election, they're on trial. And she didn't say it, but we all heard it, right? And don't you forget it. And she was saying that to Judge McAfee, and she was saying that to America. My biggest concern about this evidence you're hearing from day one was the blanket allowance of the weaponization of the judicial system to conduct a smear campaign. And that's exactly what the bread and butter is for Michael Roman, the GOP operative who is the defendant in this case. He's being prosecuted for state RICO and other charges. That is how he rolls. And so that is exactly why we ended up having a multi-day, multi-hour evidentiary hearing about the personal lives of Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis. But the undercurrent of reality that a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about is the following. I don't disagree that if you're a prosecutor, you should be held to a standard and a, and a very exacting one. And I believe Paul would, have, would agree with me on this, right? You should be held to an exacting standard because as a prosecutor, you hold the liberty of people in your hands. And so you should be the very best that you are as a lawyer, especially if you're a prosecutor. But the undercurrent of conversation that people are not having is the idea that if you listen to the commentary... It always devolved into the fact that it was, did she take the cash and did she run to the ATM with it? And, and what did she do with that cash? And cash boxes in your home and who the hell has that type of cash in your home? I mean, it, it was the devolution of 
the, of something that should have been up here, right? It, it should have been here. And so the thing that happened with the McAfee ruling from today was he could have ended the analysis at there was no actual conflict of interest because the law would have protected that analysis for him. And he could have stayed in that safe space and he could have said the burden wasn't met by the defense, which he did say. And because of that, I am not going to disqualify either of these prosecutors. But he didn't. And by going that one step further, going into the land of the Georgia State Bar for example, going into that space and saying that there was all of this wrongdoing, he not only gave kerosene on the conflagration, which is the GOP and the Trump world and, and MAGA, but he also then created, as he noted, that, quote, odor of, uh, of I, I don't even remember what the word mendacity. was. Mendacity. It, it was mendacity. Mendacity, which if people tried to look it up, would say it stinks. And then what he said, right? That's really what he's trying to say, something stinks here. And, and I think that in doing so, he never really allowed Fonnie Willis to cure that defect. He says, you can cure this defect if one of you steps down. But when you kind of label it that way, you don't allow really for the curing of any defect, do you? And so then you allow this prosecution to continue tainted based upon the use of that language.